After two months in South Africa in fall water with Marilyn Cook, we fly north to Egypt. When we arrive in Cairo, we're dismayed to find out that our luggage didn't make it with us. Because we were filling out paperwork and answering questions, we were two hours later than expected leaving the airport. We were so grateful that the driver our hotel had arranged for us was still patiently waiting. When we finally arrived at our hotel, it was about one o'clock in the morning. Someone on the staff went out to find us some toothbrushes and toothpaste. The next morning, after a good breakfast at our hotel, we're back to the airport to fly south to Luxor. Our taxi driver had a Christian icon in his car. I asked him if he was a Christian, and he said yes. When we got out of the taxi, Phil asked if he could pray with him. And while they prayed, I cautiously looked around to see if we were going to be stoned. We're staying at the El Faro's Hotel. The building is new and the rooms are large. There's a large, quiet garden restaurant with good shade and even better food. We immediately walk to this nearby pharmacy for some necessary toiletries. We woke up the next morning to the sound of donkeys braying, dogs barking, roosters crowing, and the call to prayers. When we saw these chickens peeking over the wall of our garden restaurant, Phil remarked that our eggs must surely be fresh. The road outside our hotel is unpaved and serves as a playground for the children. The atmosphere reminds me of a tranquil village. It's only a five minute walk to the ferry to cross the Nile. <laughs> it was great. This line of sphinxes used to stretch all the way to the Karnak Temple, two miles downriver. It seemed amazing that we could walk just a few minutes from the ferry and visit one of the most spectacular sites in Upper Egypt. The Temple of Luxor was built in the middle of what was then the city of Thebes in the 14th century BC.
As hard as it is for me to imagine, this entire temple was once buried in sand. favorite Fanta drink and a rest in the shade, we head back to the ferry and our hotel. After lunch, I took a walk down by the river. On my walk, I met Fatima, who insisted I take her picture. Keeping our flies at bay. It's not nearly as much fun as Kathy's zapper. There's no zap when you whack them here. We'll zap in the whap. Later in the afternoon, I got these pictures from the top of our hotel.
This is Gloria, a friendly American now living in Germany, but staying at this hotel for a month or so. When our waiter heard our luggage was missing, he asked if he could go home and get us some clothes. We declined. We're transported by Feluca down the Nile for about an hour to join our cruise ship. It was a beautiful, peaceful trip. From the Nile River. on our ship after our Feluca ride. Our ship is very nice. Our room is large and we have a river view. Due to recent political unrest in Egypt, our ship is less than half full. It's great that we don't have to deal with the crowds, but I do feel sorry for the Egyptians in the tourist industry. This evening we met the other two members of our small group, Z and Martin from Czechoslovakia. He works with the Czech Embassy in Cairo. We get up at 6 the next morning and soon we and Martin and Z and our guide Muhammad are off to the Valley of the Kings. Howard Carter, the famous archaeologist who located King Tut's tomb, lived here while he was in Egypt. We visited three tombs today, Ramses IV, Ramses III, and Ramses I. Considering the ages of these paintings, the colors are amazing. Muhammad says every three or four years they're cleaned with cotton and alcohol. The tomb of Ramses I was the best preserved with its deepest and longest shaft. The mortuary temple of Hapshepsut is spectacular. The other temples we have and will see in Egypt are very similar to one another in design. But Hapshepsut's is unique and that makes it especially remarkable. She ruled Egypt for about 20 years. She was the only female ruler of Egypt to call herself Pharaoh and wear the false beard. This is the Chapel of Anubis. The colors are amazingly preserved.
these two 60-foot high statues are all that are left of the mortuary temple of Amenhotep III. According to archaeologists, this site was larger than Karnak, but it was built on the actual Nile floodplain and washed away. When we returned to the ship, Phil and I walked to another pharmacy for some toiletries. When I saw a picture of Jesus on the wall, I asked the proprietor if she was a Christian, and she began to cry. We held her hands and prayed for her there in the store. That evening, Muhammad invited the four of us to go to a local sidewalk cafe for a cup of hibiscus tea. Z and Muhammad opted for a hookah, or a water pipe, where flavored tobacco passes through a water basin. After Martin and Z's balloon ride the next morning, we're off to one of the most jaw-dropping, not-to-be-missed sites in all of Egypt, Karnak Temple. Karnak is actually a number of temples. Some may have been built as early as 20 centuries BC. Perhaps 30 pharaohs contributed to the buildings, and the size and the number of the features is simply overwhelming. Muhammad was so knowledgeable about Egypt and he gave us so many facts and so much folklore about the country that we simply could not retain.
the size of these is just unbelievable. 134 columns rising around us like the trees of a giant forest. we start the cruise. This afternoon, Muhammad had some wonderful news for us. Our luggage arrived and is waiting for us at the Cairo airport. The scenic cruise down the Nile is peaceful and very enjoyable. In three separate incidents this afternoon and early evening, entrepreneurs somehow attached their small rowboats to our huge ship and proceeded to shout, Hello! until they gained attention. They displayed their wares, tablecloths, shirts, and long dresses, and bargained with tourists. If someone showed interest, the item was placed in a plastic weighted bag and tossed up three stories. The purchaser placed the money in the plastic bag and tossed it back to the boat. A most unusual way to make a sale and a great photo opportunity. A number of practicing Muslims worked on the ship and they were provided this area for daily prayers.
Later that evening, we proceed through the locks into Lake Nasser. I feel so sorry for these underfed, overworked horses, and I hate to encourage the cab drivers, but Muhammad had already made the arrangements, so off we went. The city also was called the city of the beautiful meeting to commemorate the beautiful meeting between the god Horus and his wife. Because it was the last big temple to have been built, and because it was built well above the Nile and escaped flood damage, the Temple of Horus at Edfu is one of the best preserved. It's hard to imagine. The temple was actually buried, like the Luxor Temple, under the village when excavators started to dig it out in the middle of the 19th century. It took almost 40 years to clear it out entirely. and they start pointing the evil ankle, the hippo. And then the same scene is going to be repeated. Later in the afternoon, we dock to visit the temple of Komombo. In the light of the sunset, this temple is especially charming and graceful. The king, he succeeded to control our and lower east and west bank with his powerful state, with his powerful base. Muhammad lives in Aswan. 
He's married and has one child, a daughter Judy. On this short cruise, we became very fond of Martin and Zee. We wish them well. We say goodbye to the ship this morning and we're off for a very full day. In the 1970s, the British built Aswan Dam caused the flooding of a number of Egyptian temples. UNESCO raised this temple complex 66 feet higher than its original location on Filet Island. The Romans built this colonnade leading to the gate of Ptolemy II. The Temple of Isis is the largest structure on the island. The boat takes us back to the mainland and we're driven for a quick look at the high dam and this garish monument to Soviet Egyptian friendship. We leave Martin and Z with Muhammad and we fly on our own to Abu Simbel. When the high dam was completed in 1971, the Nile River Valley was flooded. Lake Nasser was created with almost 2,000 square miles of water. The entire country of Nubia was submerged. All of Nubia's citizens were displaced. Our guide Muhammad is a Nubian descendant. Some 1200 years before Christ, the Pharaoh Ramses II carved into the rock of the Nile Valley in the country we now know as Nubia, one of the most famous monuments in the world. In the 1960s, an international effort saved these monuments from being flooded by cutting them into blocks and moving them to high ground. It's sad to see this graffiti from the 1800s. Captives.
Ramses dedicated this second temple to Hathor for his favorite wife, Nefertari. This is the temple of Nefertari and Nefertari. Phil and I walked behind the monuments to get a view of the fake hill that was created to cover the anchor for these temples when they were moved. We fly back to Aswan for one more stop in southern Egypt. The unfinished obelisk. Due to a flaw in the stone, this would-be obelisk was abandoned. If this massive rock had been cut loose as intended, it would have weighed more than 1,100 tons. Because it was left, we've been able to determine how they were able to create these huge monuments. Here we are in the Aswan Airport, waiting for our flight to Cairo. Thank the Lord. When we got back to the Cairo Airport, the wonderful man who had been sent to from our hotel to pick us up was able to walk us through all of the red tape, bureaucracy, and Arabic to be able to be reunited again with our luggage. The next morning, Z and Martin picked us up for a great sightseeing day outside of Cairo. Our trip outside the city took a little longer due to these unexpected and unusual roadblocks. <laughs> the Bent Pyramid, as far as age, was built before the pyramids in Giza. The Bent Pyramid certainly lives up to its name. The theory is that the builder started at one angle, about 55 degrees, but realized midway that it just wasn't going to work and made a drastic alteration to about 44 degrees. This pyramid is called the North Pyramid and the builders used a more conservative 43 degree angle of attack We made a steep 98-foot climb to get to the entrance. These tourists were from China, and I got to use my one-word vocabulary of Mandarin. We decided to forego the 230-foot slope down to the chambers. Our next stop was Memphis, which used to be the capital of Egypt. This 43-foot alabaster statue of Ramses II is incredibly big. Not far from Memphis, our next stop is Saqqara.
there are a number of tombs here with spectacular wall paintings. The main draw here is this step pyramid, the oldest one we'll see today, built something like 2,600 years before Christ. In the distance we see the Giza pyramids, which wouldn't have been possible without these first pyramids at Dasher and Saqqara. Martin and Z said, in Cairo you go to Abu Sid for real Egyptian food. We had fava beans and stuffed grape leaves and chicken and walnut sauce and other delicious dishes that I cannot begin to remember. The next day we're on our way to see the pyramids at Giza. I know it's a cliché, but really there's nothing like them. It's a sight I'll never forget. And then there's the city of Giza, right at the steps. standing in line to go in this pyramid. We spent some time just walking around and enjoying the pyramids. I loved it. It still amazes me to see how few people there are here now. Okay, so we're tired of walking and we have hired a cab, a horse cab, to take us down to the Sphinx. At least that's the what Sphinx. Think. Yes. yes. To the Sphinx, then to the parking lot. Of the park. Yes. yes. Okay. We're staying on Zamalik Island in the middle of the Nile because I thought we'd feel safe here, and we did. Although past its prime when the British ruled Egypt, a lot of stately villas remain near our hotel.
Egypt's National Collection of Archaeological Treasures has been housed in this beautiful building since 1902. It's on Tahrir Square, where just a few months ago, fierce demonstrations were held. We were not allowed to take any pictures inside the museum, but we saw wonderful treasures, including some from King Tut's tomb. Is your ice cream good? <laughs> our last meal in Egypt was at this little coffee shop down the street from our hotel. Now there's nothing left to do but to wait until it's time to go to the airport to catch our plane to go home. We have been truly blessed with another incredible trip.